The Story of Live Dolls by Josephine Scribner Gates. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Characters Crowd 1. Read to you by Patty Brown. Crowd 2. Read by Nora Nelson. Janie. Read by Natalia. Mama. Read by Penny Coffeen. Papa. Read by Greg Giordano. Queen. Read by Stunning. Dolly. Read by Trisha G. Doll One. Read by Victoria Bell. Dinah. Read by the Countess. Mama Doll. Read by Rapunzelina. Gardener. Read by Lange Fisher. Santa Claus. Read by Larry Wilson. Narrator. Read by Anne Fletcher. Look what's coming! And with a shout of delight, the children of Cloverdale Village left their play and rushed into the street. What do you think they saw? A tiny gilded coach drawn by two beautiful white kittens with reins of blue ribbons covered with silver bells, and through the coach window the face of a wonderful doll. On her head was a jaunty sailor hat, from under which yellow curls danced in the wind as she nodded and smiled at the children on either side. From time to time she tossed out a handful of bills, which flew about like little white birds and then fluttered to the ground, where they were eagerly caught up by the fast-gathering crowd of children, filled with wonder at the amazing sight. They made a brave effort to keep up with the coach, but the driver cracked his whip, the kittens started at a mad pace down the hill, and with one last nod and smile from the doll in the window, the coach disappeared in a cloud of dust. The children watched it out of sight and then turned to go back. But what were these bills, which in the excitement they had forgotten and were still clutching in their hot and dirty hands? Again and again they read these startling words, which stared them in the face. Notice. On the morning of June the 4th, all the dolls in the village of Cloverdale will be alive. That was all. And it was to happen tomorrow, for this was the third day. They looked at one another with eyes growing larger and rounder, and cheeks growing redder than the roses blossoming in the gardens. Then such a chatter began that even the birds had to stop singing to listen. I never heard of such a thing. How could they? Wouldn't it be perfectly lovely? And suddenly realising what a blissful thing was in store for them, if it were really true, the children began to hug each other and dance about and squeal with joy until their various mothers came to the windows to learn the cause of the commotion. When the little ones caught sight of them, remembering that they had not heard the wonderful news, they shouted, Let's tell our mamas! and quickly disappeared. Janie Bell's home was the nearest. She fairly flew up the steps and tumbled into the door as she said, Oh, Mama, it's going to begin tomorrow. Won't it be lovely? A doll came in in a gold carriage and she threw this bell, and a boy doll drove the white kittens all covered with ribbons and bells, and it was too pretty. Do you think my dolls could come alive? Mama wiped the little hot face and read the bill. It does seem strange, but I don't know of a lovelier thing that could happen to a little girl than to have her doll come to life. What a fine time there would be in the dollhouse, she said, glancing out of the window at a beautiful little house under the trees. It was just like a real house, with a porch across the front, a real doorbell, tiny shades and Swiss curtains at the windows, and a little brick chimney upon the roof. Janie clapped her hands. Oh, Mama, won't it be fine? I can hardly wait. She flew out of the door and into the dollhouse. Each room was in good order, for Janie was a fine housekeeper. Papa had given the dolls home to her, thinking that if the little girl learned to keep this one in order, she would some day be able to take care of a larger one. She looked at the parlour with its mimic furniture, a sofa, chairs, piano, and a grate where she could build a fire if Mamma were watching. Then she went into the dining room, where the table was set all ready for dinner. Oh, how lovely it would 
be to see the dolls sitting there and actually eating. In the kitchen was a little range with an oven, and there Dinah, the black cook, was propped against the wall, looking as if she were only waiting for the magic word to set her marching off getting dinner. Her wig would probably fall off, as it was loose, and her leg was broken. Janey resolved to mend her at once, as it would not do to have her come alive in that condition. She peeped into the dear little pantry, at the kettles, skillets and shining pans on the shelves, and at the tiny box marked cake. In one corner was an ice box, in another a flour barrel. Upstairs there were dolls of all ages and sizes, Papa, Mama and children. A little baby in long dresses lay in a cradle, and other dolls were sitting and standing about some dressed and some, I'm sorry to say, stark naked. Janey dressed and arranged them all in various attitudes, then seized with a sudden inspiration, she exclaimed, Well, if it is true, we'll have the best time in this little house we ever had, and I'm going to get ready for it. So she swept it from top to bottom, washed the little windows, tied back the pretty curtains with fresh ribbons, dusted the furniture, made the beds, washed the dolls' faces, mended Dinah's leg and fastened her wig, flitted about from room to room, giving each one a last fond look, and then she locked the front door and hung the key on the branch of a tree where it was safely hidden by the leaves. The sun was setting and papas were coming home to their supper. All seemed as usual, but it was a new and very exciting world to this little mother, for the morning was to bring strange doings. Janey hurried in to eat her supper and to get to bed early. It seems almost like Christmas, Mama. I can hardly wait for tomorrow, she said as she kissed her mother good night. Mama laughed merrily. Well, close your bright eyes and the birdies will be singing their morning song before you know it, she said. Janey leaned out of bed to kiss her big dolly, who was sleeping peacefully in a cradle by her side. No dolly ever had better care, for Janey was a kind little mother. She took her to the table for each meal, gave her a lovely ride every day, and at night carefully undressed her and tucked her into bed. Won't it be beautiful? Janey whispered as she gave the cradle a little jog. But dolly slept on quite unconscious of the fact that in the morning she was to be as full of life and dancing gaiety as Janey herself. As for Janey, she hardly dared think about it, for if she once began to imagine what bliss was in store for her, she would never get to sleep. During the night she dreamed all sorts of things. Towards morning it seemed that she and Dolly were riding in an eggshell coach, drawn by two downy yellow chickens. Dolly suddenly stood up and began to sing, frightening the chickens so that they ran away and tipped over the carriage. Of course, at this catastrophe, Janey wakened, but her dream seemed to go on, and she still heard a voice singing. Could it be her doll? She hardly dared move as she remembered what was to happen today. She listened a moment and then peeped out. At sight of her, Dolly held up both arms and said, yes, actually said, Oh, you dear little mamma, I am so glad you are awake. I want to come into your bed. And up she popped and climbed in under the covers and snuggled up exactly as Janey often snuggled up to her mamma. Janey hugged her, but for a moment was too frightened and astonished to speak. Miss Dolly began to laugh and giggle so loud that Papa and Mama came running in. It's true, Mama, it's true, look at her. Of course it's true, said Dolly. Didn't the Queen of the Dolls decide that it should be? It had to be true when she said it. But let's get up and dress. You'll be surprised to see what's happening in the doll house. Janey gave a little scream of delight, hopped out of bed and scrambled into her clothes. Dolly was quicker than she, and was soon dressed and standing on a chair by the side of the bed, for Janey had to watch and laugh over the funny spectacle of Dolly dressing herself. 
Now brush my hair, please, peeled out Miss Dolly as Janey finished. Janey gave her another hug as she brushed the brown curls around her finger. And then they ran pell-mell down the stairway and raced out of the house. The family all laughed heartily, for it was a funny sight to see a doll run. They could hardly believe their eyes and hurried into their clothes, for they too were eager to see these wonderful doings in the doll house. As Janey ran across the lawn, she noticed smoke coming from the chimney. She flew up the steps, unlocked the front door, and as she stepped into the hall, beheld the astonishing sight of Black Dinah at the toy telephone. She was just saying, One stick, please. And then she called up the grocery store and ordered a bill of goods that would empty almost any housekeeper's pocketbook. Dinah paid no attention to the visitors, but swept the front steps, glanced into the dining room to see if all was ready for breakfast, and then went into the kitchen. The fire was crackling in the range, and while Dinah waited for the groceries, Janey ran upstairs. The dolls were dressing in the different rooms, and Mama Doll was trying to make the baby comfortable. Its cries soon brought Dinah up with a cunning milk bottle all filled. Baby took it and nestled down into her pillow with it, just as any baby would who had to be fed in that horrid way. Janey longed to pick her up, but as she wished very much to see Dinah get breakfast, she thought she'd wait until another time. A knock downstairs announced the grocery boy, and Janey went down to find the table covered with little packages containing flour, sugar, coffee, eggs, and everything needed in a real kitchen. She longed to help put the articles in place, but Dinah looked queer and cross, so she didn't dare touch anything. It was no wonder Dinah was cross, for what do you think Janey had done in her haste the day before? She had put the poor thing's leg on backward and had pasted her wig on crooked, way down over one ear, so of course she wasn't very comfortable. After putting everything away, Dinah got a dish, broke an egg into it, oh, such a tiny egg, about as large as a bird's, and with a dear little egg-beater, whisked it as light as a feather. Then she poured in some milk and added flour with a little salt and baking powder. Janey wondered what she was going to make and glanced at the range. Oh, joy pancakes! She cried as she spied the smoking hot griddle the size of a small saucer. Dinah put on the broiler and laid the steak carefully on it, cut a potato into dice and put it into a pan with a little cream. Then, with a dash of salt and pepper on the steak, which was soon done to a turn, she placed it on a platter and generously buttered it. When all was ready, she rang a toy bell, and the family of dolls filed down into the dining room. They seated themselves, and Papa served the food. When he carved the steak, the knife bent double, for it was really never meant for use. Why, I must go and buy another. I didn't know it was so poor, said Mama Doll, as she poured the coffee into the tiny cups and added cream and sugar. How funny they all looked, sitting there and really eating! Janey tried to smother a hysterical laugh and made such a queer sound that they all looked up. She felt almost disgraced when her big doll, who had followed her about, whispered, Come away, or you'll hurt their feelings. And now came Dinah with a plate of cakes about the size of a penny. Each doll clamoured for one. How good they looked! Janey ran to the kitchen. She must bake those cakes. Oh, Dinah, please let me. I will be very careful. Well, Miss Janey, you may, but I am cross today. My hair is so crooked, and look at my leg. How could you put it on backwards? I have so much work to do, and it is so hard to walk. Why, Dinah, you poor thing, did I do that? I will take it right off and turn it around. It won't take me more than a minute, and it will soon dry. Dinah screamed. What? Don't you think I have any feelings? How would you like to have your papa break your leg and turn it around, and you sit waiting for the glue to dry? 
and with a scornful sniff she hobbled in with another plate of cakes. When the family had finally finished eating, there was still considerable batter left. Janey begged for some cakes for herself. Dinah consented, and so Janey and Miss Dolly sat down to eat, taking care to save some cakes for Dinah. It certainly was bliss to watch the butter melt on those beautiful brown cakes and to pour the golden syrup from the syrup cup, which had come all the way from Boston only last Christmas. "'Aren't they delicious?' said a piping voice. Janie jumped up and almost dropped the syrup cup. She'd been so busy over those darling cakes that she'd almost forgotten about her doll sitting opposite her at table. "'Oh, you precious thing! I never can get used to hearing you talk. How many times I have played tea party here with you and had to do all the talking myself!' And she ran round and gave her another hug. Let's go and tell Papa and Mama about the breakfast, she added. But as they stepped outside, they found the family peeping in at the window. Isn't this fun, Mama? And did you see the cunning pancakes? The Mama doll is actually going shopping because my knives won't cut meat. The baby was really crying and I must go up and see her. She rattled on without giving them time to reply and then ran up the stairway with the big doll tripping after her. Stopping at the door of the bedroom, she clasped her hands in rapture, for Mama Doll was giving Baby a bath. It was kicking up its weenty heels and gurgling and cooing just like a real baby. While Mama was scrubbing, suddenly Baby grabbed the end of the washcloth. Of course, it cried when she took it away, and then it stopped to listen, for Mama had wound up the little music box. So the bath went on till Baby was all clean down to its little toes, which Mama kissed and folded tenderly in the blanket. Then she dressed it and laid it in its cradle. Janie made a motion to take it, but Mama shook her head, and whispering that it was asleep, she quietly put the room in order and drew down the shades. The doll children were making a great racket, and Mama called to them to run out and play so Baby could sleep. Janie and Miss Dolly followed. As they passed through the kitchen, Dinah was just finishing a marvellous pie, as large as a silver dollar, and singing, There's a good time coming by and by. As she opened the oven door, Janie caught a glimpse of a dear little bird roasting, and oh, how good it smelled! A dish of cranberries was cooling in the window, and as Dinah left the room for a moment, Janie couldn't resist peeping into the ice box. There was a block of real ice and a pan of milk with cream on the top of it. How she longed to skim it with the little skimmer! Then she espied a dish of something that looked like custard, which she was about to taste when Dinah's voice startled her. What you are doing in my ice box? I only wanted to know what that was said Janey respectfully, for she was a little afraid of Dinah since the leg affair. It's for ice cream, and I's a notion to let you freeze it. I's got a heap of work this morning. Oh, Dinah, may I? And Janey danced a hornpipe then and there and threw her arms around Dinah's neck. You are a dear, and I am sorry I put your leg on wrong. I do wish I could fix it. Never mind, honey. I couldn't go through with that operation no how, said Dinah, as she got the freezer and chopped the ice into bits, then poured in the custard and left it for Janie to finish. With her dear companion by her side, she worked until the handle began to turn hard when she knew it was frozen. Dinah, can't we lick the ladder? Mama always lets me. Dinah said she might, and she dutifully gave Dolly half. She was sorely tempted to get a spoon and taste that in the freezer, as Dinah had left the room, but she knew that that would not be honest, so she covered it up and ran into the yard to see the dull children at play. She was just in time to see, coming slowly down the street, a white covered wagon marked in red letters, Doll's Ambulance. It was drawn by six white kittens, who moved along so carefully that Janie decided they must have some very sick patients aboard. It halted in front of the dollhouse, and the little queen dismounted, saying she was going to telephone. 
Meantime, Janey, curious to see what was within, walked around to the back and peeped in at the little open door. There she saw a most piteous sight. It was filled with dolls of all sizes and in such a condition. Arms and legs were off, wigs were missing, and some dolls lay with their poor sightless eyes staring up at her in such a pathetic manner that Janey could hardly keep back the tears. One poor little thing lay apart from the others and was dripping wet. Her companions sobbed aloud as they told in low tones of how she was fished out of a water barrel, stone dead. Not even the queen could bring her to life. Each had some trouble. Some told of how their mamas had lost their arms and legs, and how their wigs had been off for weeks. Some were sadly neglected, many being wrapped in small bed quilts and soiled blankets as they hadn't a stitch to put on. They told Janey that the Queen had appeared that morning and gathered them up from their different homes and was going to take them to a doll's hospital. She was telephoning now to make preparations for their arrival. The Queen soon appeared, and their piteous wailing ceased as she hovered over them, soothing this one and that, placing some in more comfortable positions, wiping away tears which were rolling down the cheeks of little handless dolls, and telling them all to cheer up, that they would soon be made as good as new, except the poor dead one, which they would lay away tenderly in some quiet spot and cover with pretty flowers. The Queen invited Janey's doll to go with them, and as they slowly departed, Janey looked so wistfully after them that she called to her to jump onto her wheel and follow. Janey ran in to ask Mamma, and was soon spinning along after them. By and by, they turned into a country road and down a long lane, at the end of which she saw a high wall. The Queen told them that it enclosed a number of acres of land, and that the place was called the Doll Farm. They all alighted before a great gate, and the Queen blew a wee silver bugle that hung by a silver chain from her belt. The gate swung open, and when they had all entered it closed immediately after them. The Queen led them up a path towards a building bearing the sign, The Doll's Hospital. Janey was too much astonished at the sight that met her eyes to follow. All she could see was an orchard of low trees, whose branches hung full of doll clothes swaying in the cool morning air. There were tiny undergarments and dresses of all colours. She reached out to examine a particularly pretty one and to see just how it was made, when a voice startled her. Don't touch that. It isn't ripe yet. Ripe? said Janey. Is it growing? Why, of course. Now see, the buttonholes aren't begun yet, and the buttons aren't near tight enough. It will be about two weeks before that frock can be picked. Now here's one I can pick tomorrow. And he explained to Janey just how he could tell when it was ready to be removed from the tree. Then the gardener, for it was he, showed her the trees full of undergarments and dear little petticoats, the bushes of different coloured stockings with shoes and slippers to match, and last of all, a tree of hats. They were the sweetest things, of many different shapes, and from the end of each branch hung bright ribbons of all colours. Nearby grew all sorts of flowers. The gardener told Janey she might trim a few of the hats if she cared to, as they were all ready to pick. Now, if there was one thing Janey liked more than another, it was to trim hats. So the gardener picked a number and allowed her to choose the ribbons and flowers. She chose red, blue, pink and white ribbons, and roses, forget-me-nots, pansies and morning glories. You must remember, these were all dwarf flowers, much smaller than ours, and the gardener told her they were everlasting and so would not wither. Janey seated herself under a tree, from whose branches dainty parasols of all colours were dancing and nodding in the breeze. She would have been eager to pick them at any other time, but now with her lap full of such visions of beauty, she was blind to everything else about her. 
She arranged the bows and flowers, and soon had this lot of hats trimmed, and begged for more. Finishing a number, she placed them in long rows on the shelves built for that purpose. She then threw herself on the ground to rest, and glancing up, saw the parasols. She clapped her hands and bounded to her feet. Oh, Mr. Gardener, can't I have one? He said she might, and asked her which one she wanted. That beautiful blue one. No, the pink one. Oh, no, wait a moment, that white one. I think. Oh, Mr. Gardener, please let me look a moment. They are all so sweet. She finally decided on the blue, a beauty with lace and forget-me-nots around the top. The pink one had a wreath of wild roses, and it was hard to give that up. But the blue matched her doll's new dress, and so that decided it. Then the gardener told her that after a while she could help him pick the various garments for the army of dolls that had just arrived, but that now she had better go into the hospital and see what they were doing there. And so he led her into the house. Here Janey found the poor crippled dolls being put in fine shape by little doll nurses, wearing soft grey dresses with white aprons and caps. Legs and arms were being replaced, the blind were made to see with blue eyes and brown. Bald heads were covered, and such a wealth of hair did those dolls have, some curly, some braided and tied with a ribbon, and some hanging straight for the dolls' mamas to braid or curl as they chose. When their bodies had finally reached perfection, they went into a bathroom for a sorely needed bath, and Janie went to help the gardener. Together they wandered about, plucking an outfit for each doll. It was great fun to match the dresses in slippers and stockings, and then to complete the costumes with the proper hats. When they carried the frocks in, what a hubbub arose! Each doll wanted every dress! The little queen quieted them and gave a suit to each one, which they soon put on, and they looked so sweet, clean and pretty that their own mamas would hardly know them. The Queen called for the bill, paid it, and departed with her family, looking like the old woman who lived in a shoe. They made a very pretty picture as they walked out, appearing like a lot of gorgeous butterflies. As before, the gate swung open at a peal from the silver bugle. All climbed into the ambulance once more, and away they went, with Janie following. When they reached home, they found the yard full of little girls weeping for their lost dolls. But as each dolly jumped down and ran to its own mamma, what a chattering and babbling filled the air! Who mended you? What lovely hair! Where did you get those clothes? cried the little girls. The strange tale which Janey told them of all she had seen, and especially of the clothes growing on trees, seemed too wonderful to be believed, and they envied her such delightful experiences. The little queen then mounted the steps and gave them a short lecture. She told them how kind they ought always to be to their dolls, just as kind as they wished their mamas to be to them. She said that when she went from house to house, gathering up all the old dollies to have them made like new, she was shocked to see the condition of some of them. One had a hopeless crack in its head because its mamma got cross and threw it up to the ceiling. Some of them were naked, and most of them were very dirty. Her eyes filled with tears as she spoke of the poor little dead one, and she said she could always tell what kind of heart a little girl had by the way she treated her doll. Those who made the sweetest and tenderest mamas were those who had taken the most loving care of their dollies when they were little girls. She wanted them to begin over and see who could be the best mother during the few weeks that followed. Then they all sat on the grass, and Dinah appeared with cunning glasses of lemonade and tiny sandwiches, and they enjoyed this almost more than the lecture. When they had finished, the Queen said goodbye, 
telling them to enjoy each other while they could, as this bliss was to last but a month. Only little girls with live dolls can know of the happiness that followed. It was no uncommon thing to see dolls playing ring around a rosy and hide-and-seek, or jumping ropes and rolling hoops. Janey never tired of watching them, and she and her precious doll had many romps. Early one morning there was left at the door a miniature invitation, which announced that a picnic was to be held at the doll farm the next day. Janey ran into the doll house to ask if they would go, and found Dinah busy cooking for it. She had just finished the layer cakes, which had been baked in the lids of baking powder cans. They were all iced, some with chocolate, others with plain white. A number of tiny square loaves of angel food and sponge cake looked so good that Janey longed to pocket one. Dinah allowed her to cut out the fried cakes with a thimble, and when they were a golden brown, she rolled them in pulverised sugar until they looked like a heap of white marbles. Dinah then made a batch of cookies, which Janie cut also. Next came a lot of jelly tarts and apple turnovers, so crisp they would undoubtedly melt in your mouth. And last but not least, she made dozens of the dearest little baking powder biscuits, and when they were baked, Janie opened and buttered them and put in pieces of dried beef shaved very thin. They were delicious. Janie received one from Dinah and longed to swallow a dozen. Then Dinah boiled a number of eggs, for which Janie tied up packages of salt and pepper, as these are necessary for every picnic. She then helped to place the food on the pantry shelf, ready to pack in a hamper the next morning. How tempting it looked! When they had squeezed lemons for lemonade and frozen the ice cream, they sat down to rest. Dinah said it was to be a delightful picnic given by the Queen to all the dolls and their mamas. Every little girl in the village was invited, and she did hope she had enough to eat. Janie ran home to tell Mamma about it, and to ask if she couldn't make something for the lunch. Mamma thought for a moment. I know the very thing, she said. Jump onto your wheel and go to each little girl's house, and tell her to be here at three this afternoon, and to be sure to wear an old dress. You're the darlingest Mamma, Janie cried, as she hugged her and ran away with a delightful feeling of mystery. It must be lovely if Mama planned it, but what can it be? Promptly at three, all were on hand. Mama took them to the kitchen. We will make some doll candy, and I will show you how, she said. They had to relieve their excited feelings by dancing a jig at this delightful news, and then they settled down to work. They first made some chocolate drops, the weentiest little things you ever saw, then some marshmallows, which were about the size of Parcheesi dice. Next, they made maple creams and dear old-fashioned molasses candy, which the children were allowed to pull, and the one who succeeded in getting her piece the whitest was to have a dainty little box of the mixed candies. It was great fun. When it was finished, it looked so good that Mamma had to divide a box among them. Then she brought out the popper, and the children went gaily about shelling the corn. This is always a delight to pop, and when they had a heaping dish of it, they made it into popcorn balls about the size of marbles. While they waited for the candy to harden, they ran into the garden to play and to talk over these strange happenings. Oh, children, what lovely times we are having, said Janie. I wish they could last always. And each one piped in. Yes, but they can't, so we must enjoy them while they do last. I know one thing. I do take better care of my doll now. I never used to keep her face clean, and she was nearly always naked. It was mine that was ruined, from me throwing her up to the wall. I was so mad at her that day, just because I couldn't make her dress fit. But I have a new one now. And I'm very careful of her. And mine was drowned. 
but I really was sorry after I did it. She wouldn't stand up, and I grew cross, and I threw her into the water. But of course, I never knew she had any feelings. There goes my new one now, riding the wheel which Papa had made for her. The girls clapped their hands with delight at the unusual spectacle. To think of a doll on a wheel! What would happen next? Just then, Mamma's voice summoned them to the kitchen, where they found a great basket of little candy boxes in the forms of hearts, diamonds, half-moons, drums, and cunning barrels. They packed the candy neatly and tied each box with a pretty ribbon. Then the boxes were placed in the basket, ready for the morrow, and the little girls departed for their homes. The next day proved to be fine, and soon after breakfast the children and their dolls were assembled in Janie's yard. They were clad in pretty dresses and looked as sweet and fresh as a lot of daisies. Then appeared two tallyhos, the one for the dolls being drawn by four curly white dogs. The Queen's own boy doll driver snapped the whip and the air was at once filled with the noise of the barking of the dogs and the music of the bells on the harness of the restless steeds. The tallyho for the children was much larger and was drawn by four cream-white ponies. They were all packed in like sardines in a box, the little Queen sitting in the midst of the dolls. The silver bugle was blown, the chains and bells jangled, and away they flew. They were barely started when they heard Dinah calling. She was frantically waving a red bandana kerchief and beckoning them to come back, so back they went. You don't forgot about me, she shouted. You? Why, Dinah, are you going? asked Janie. Course I is, and I don't like to take no liberties nor nothing, but I feel like I must tell you that you done forgot another thing that I consider mighty important to every picnic, and that is the lunch what I's been working at this long time. This speech caused a hearty shout of laughter. Mamma came to help put in the hamper and baskets, and Dinah sat in state by the driver. With her red kerchief on her head and her yellow dress, she looked like a great bumblebee hovering over the dainty doll flowers. As they rode away, Mamma heard her singing her favourite song. There's a good time coming by and by. Perhaps she was thinking of the time when her leg would be turned around, or perhaps of how much they would enjoy the toothsome luncheon she'd prepared. They had a fine ride, as it was a beautiful day, and they were all so perfectly happy. They sang and shouted, and were envied by all the boys in the village, who were deprived of these pleasures, because boys are so dreadful in their treatment of dolls. All too soon was the ride at an end. The girls were eager to see the trees where the dolls' clothes grew, and when they were actually inside of those wonderful grounds, they ran here and there like ants. The Queen first led them around to her own home, which Janie had not seen when she was there before. It was the dearest little place, with climbing rose vines twined about the doors and windows, and was beautifully furnished with everything one could wish for. The Queen's own bedroom was like fairyland, the bed had Swiss curtains draped about it, tied back with blue ribbons. There was a lovely desk, filled with tiny doll paper and envelopes, and a little gold pen and a cut glass inkstand. Here she had written those gracious invitations. The closet was filled with beautiful little dresses. A shoebox held various coloured shoes and slippers, also bed slippers and a dear little pair of rubbers. On the dresser was everything any young lady could desire. It was charmingly arranged with a lace cover over blue and a dainty pin cushion, silver comb, brush and manicure set. In one corner stood a bookcase filled with books of the tiniest sort. A long window led out into a balcony. Here was stretched a doll's hammock where one could swing and pick flowers without moving for the roses twined in and out. After this, they went to see the hospital, and then to have some games with the dolls. 
They examined the trees carefully and found them most mysterious. Lunch was called before they dreamed it could be time, and as that is always the best part of a picnic, and as little girls are always hungry, they hurried to the spot where Dinah was serving. Every mamma sat by her own doll, and as the food was passed each doll helped herself. But the poor mammas were like the little pig that had none, as they were not allowed to take a morsel. And to make it worse, what do you think those saucy dollies did? Have you ever had a doll's tea party? Then you remember how you held the food to your doll's mouth, pretended to let her have some, and then gobbled it up yourself. Well, that is just what happened here. Each doll held it to her mamma's mouth, and as she tried to take it, it vanished in the doll's mouth in the most irritating manner. Every time Dinah passed, the same performance followed, and how the dolls laughed! The children grew hungrier every moment when they found those tempting viands were not for them. The ice cream looked so delicious! It was strawberry and served in small salt cellars. And then came that lovely angel food and jelly tarts. They coaxed and pleaded, but the dolls only said, That's the way you treat us at your parties. Finally, when they were on the verge of tears, the dolls relented, and Dinah brought in a fresh supply, which vanished very quickly, as everything was unusually good and the children were nearly starved. When they had finished, they presented the dolls with the boxes of candy and wound up with a merry game of hide-and-seek. The old gardener called them and said that each little girl was to be allowed to choose one entire suit for her doll. What a scramble they made for the various trees, though it was very hard to decide for everything was so pretty. Janie looked a long time before she could quite make up her mind but finally chose a pink dress with pink stockings and slippers and a hat with elegant pink plumes waving upon it. A fan and chatelaine completed this costume. She chose also the dear pink parasol she had so much wanted before. There were also stunning coats and opera capes with swans down trimming and one tree full of dear little muffs. The handkerchief tree looked too funny, with the tiny white things fluttering about like a flock of birds with wings spread ready to fly. It was a hard matter to leave this enchanting place, but as the sun was getting low, they gathered up their baskets, presented the gardener with some of their candy, and with many thanks and goodbyes departed. When they reached home, they told the Queen they never in all their lives had had such a beautiful time, and thanking her very heartily for giving them so much pleasure, they went to their homes to tell Mamma all about it. The days flew merrily by, and before they realised it, the month was almost gone. When Janie stopped to think of those happy times being no more, she was ready to cry her eyes out, but she put away the thought determined to enjoy them while they lasted. One morning at breakfast, Papa said, Mama, I think we must wind up these remarkable doings with something pretty fine. How would it do to hire several carriages and take the whole caboodle of these chicks with their wind-up dolls for a lovely day at the seashore? The various mothers, or rather grandmothers, of the dolls can go to see that they don't get drowned. There's only a drive of ten or twelve miles to the beach. You can get dinner at the hotel. I will telegraph and have that arranged for. You can all have a plunge in the surf, and the babes can dig in the sand and paddle about, and have no end of a good time. How does that strike you, Janie? Janie replied by springing into his lap and giving him a hug that almost choked him. Oh, that will be lovely, she cried, and I will write the invitations. They decided to have it the very last day of this eventful month. Janie wrote the notes which were to make so many hearts happy, and Papa went to make the necessary arrangements. The day came, and Janie sprang out of bed to raise the shade. 
instead of seeing the sun streaming in as she hoped, she found the rain was pouring down in sheets. She made a brave effort to keep back the tears as she heard her dolly singing the well-known song. Can't we make sunshine in the house when there is none without? But dolly, we can't go, sobbed Janie. Why not? came from Mamma's room. Because it's raining, Mamma. And then the tears began to fall in earnest. Rain before seven, clear before eleven, sang Papa. Don't borrow trouble, Polly love, but get dressed and see what will happen. Janie dried her eyes and obeyed, very much surprised, for she was seldom allowed to go anywhere in a rain like that. After breakfast, Mamma got out waterproof and rubbers, which Janie put on, and then waited patiently for what would follow. The doorbell rang, and a package was left for Janie's doll. On opening it, she found another tiny package marked on the outside. Not to be opened until you reach the beach. There was also a little gossamer and a pair of rubbers, which fitted Miss Dolly to perfection. How charming she looked! Janie hopped about like a young robin as she heard the delightful blast from the trumpet, which was always associated with their good times. She rushed to the window and saw, drawing up in front, two omnibuses, one filled with the various mothers, the other with the little girls and their dollies. But what was this procession which followed? Oh, Mama, it's all the dolls from the dollhouse, and each has on a tiny grossomer. How funny they look! And so they did, each carrying an umbrella and paddling through the water. Mamma, Janie and Dolly followed them, and all jumped in the omnibuses, closed the door with a bang, and away they went. It was snug and cosy inside. The rain pattered on the roof and played a steady accompaniment to the chatter of this jolly little crowd, which looked so odd, hooded and cloaked in black, like so many nuns. The little mammas cast many admiring glances at their dolls, for they had always longed for them to have these wee rainy day garments. Isn't it the greatest fun? they cried. I'm so glad it rained. It's much nicer to be shut in here and listen to it. And they hugged one another in their delight. They had a merry ride. The Queen told some delightful stories, which were so interesting that when the sun broke through the clouds they never noticed it, till the last story being finished they all shouted in one breath, Look at the sun! And now they found they were nearing the beach. They could hear the ocean roaring and could see the waves creeping up and rolling over with that great swish which once heard is never forgotten, and is the sweetest music to lovers of the sea. The buses stopped, then all tumbled out and made a mad rush for the water. Oh, the beauty of it all! How sweet the air was! Who can breathe that delightful salty odour and not love it? They played in the sand and gathered shells until eleven o'clock, when the air was warmer, and Mamma said they might put on their bathing suits. But what will the dollies do? Janie's doll waved her mysterious package, and every other doll waved one also, crying, Wait, oui, and you will see. Then all disappeared in the bathhouses. The girls hurried into their suits and awaited the dollies' reappearance with the greatest impatience. When they finally came, they pranced around them and cried, Oh, you darlings, where did you get them? And no wonder, for they were clad in the gayest little bathing suits you ever saw, with all the colours of the rainbow. How pretty they looked skipping about. They had a merry game of tag while waiting for the doll's grandmamas to disrobe, and made a beautiful picture, dotting the sand with dainty bits of bright colour. At last all were ready, and they plunged into the surf. Such fun as they had! The storm had made frothy, snowy waves, which came in faster and faster, tumbling over each other as if to see which would reach the shore first. 
the children and dolls took hold of hands and rushed in among them, only to be hurled back in one confused mass of legs, arms and heads. For a moment it would have been hard for an onlooker to tell just what it was, but the tangle soon unravelled, and the performance was repeated with an accompaniment of wild shrieks of laughter as the waves rushed over the heads of dollies, children and mamas. The mamas were soon tired out and sat on the beach to rest and watch this performance on nature's stage, and as the waves tossed the children and dolls out on the sand, they laughed till the tears ran down their cheeks. Some of the dolls were left standing on their heads, others walking about on their hands, and one poor little doll was stuck in the sand, with one leg and an arm sticking up in the air. They helped her out, and she ran into the water again, undaunted at such a slight mishap. At last they came out, breathless, and lay down on the sand to rest before dressing. They looked so funny that Mamma told them she ought to do with them as she did an old lady that she once heard of, who allowed her children to play near a little stream which ran by their home. When they fell in, she hung them on a line and fastened them with clothespins stuck through their toes. It was so odd to see them hanging in a row, ten of them. When they were dry, she took them in, sprinkled and ironed them, and let them loose again. They were hung so low it really didn't hurt them, and they thought it great fun. One day she left them hanging while she went to the store, and a thunder shower came up. She rushed home in a panic, and of course found them dripping. She took out the clothespins, shooed them into the house like a brood of chickens, gave them each some ginger tea, and hustled them into bed, piling blankets upon them till they were nearly smothered. They recovered, of course. And now, said Mamma, we must get dressed and go to dinner. They all had a hearty laugh over this remarkable tale, and thought Mamma would have to have a great many clothespins and a very long line upon which to hang them. When all were ready, they walked up to the hotel, where the guests were eagerly waiting for them. They had seen the telegram which ordered dinner to be prepared for thirty mothers, thirty children, and thirty live dolls, and they watched with the greatest interest the little girls, each with a doll by her side, march into the dining room. How astonished they were when they saw the dolls eat, actually put food into their mouths and swallow it. That was the strangest thing. The dolls weren't a bit embarrassed, however, and ate a hearty dinner and enjoyed it too, for the long ride and the bathing had given them fine appetites. After it was over they filed out and the guests after them. The grown people begged the mothers to tell them what it all meant, and their children surrounded the little girls and their dolls. Of course the story that they heard was very strange and hard to believe, but they could see this part of it with their own eyes, and so could not but believe the rest. All too soon came the omnibuses to carry them home. They were to have a pleasant open-air ride this time, as the roofs had mysteriously disappeared. With many good-byes they departed, leaving the guests with much to talk about. This had been another beautiful time, and it seemed a fitting end to the month's jubilee. But Janey couldn't be quite happy when she remembered it was the final act in this strange play. Dear little queen, she pleaded, couldn't you let it last just a little longer? We can't bear to give up these good times so soon. My precious child, this must be the end for the present. I always keep my word, and the month will be up in the morning, but she added, as the tears sprang to all of those bright eyes. If you take good care of your dolls, and try to be helpful to your mamas, I will let it happen again some day, and you may then have even a better time. So do not grieve. Remember, dear little ones, I love you with all my heart, and will plan something even more beautiful than this has been. And now she bade the driver stop at the doll farm, where was waiting the same wee coach which had so startled them at the beginning of this remarkable month. A little trunk strapped on the back, 
said plainer than words that these times were truly at an end. Giving each a loving good-bye kiss, and begging them not to be unhappy, the Queen jumped into the gay little coach and was whirled away. The children were driven to their separate homes, each hugging her doll and loath to give it up to its former existence. Janie tried to brighten up as she bade them all good-bye and said, It will happen again. The Queen said it would, and it will. So we ought to be extra good. We have had a delightful time and must be thankful for it. And just think what we have to look forward to. That night she tucked in her dolly as usual, and after one last fond kiss and a few extra caresses, was soon in the beautiful land of dreams, where we will leave her till the next time, which, as the Queen always tells the truth, must surely come some day. Perhaps it will be in the winter, when they can have merry sleigh rides and snowball battles, and perhaps, as we listen to the chimes of the Christmas bells, if we peep through a window of the doll house, we shall see a tiny Christmas tree and stockings hung by the chimney with care, and even hear dear old Santa Claus's sleigh bells, the reindeer pawing on the snowy roof, and his great voice crying, Merry Christmas to all, and to all a good night. That would indeed be a perfect time, so we will not be sad at bidding the dolls good-bye, but as the curtain falls on this act, sing with dear old Dinah. There's a good time coming by and by. End of the Story of Live Dolls by Josephine Scribner Gates Introduction to More About Live Dolls. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. More About Live Dolls by Josephine Scribner Gates. Dedication To all the wee Madonnas, wherever they may be, whose pure, sweet mother love for their dolls is to me a sacred thing and whose hunger for them to be alive is most pathetic. Introduction Ever since the appearance of The Story of Live Dolls, many eager little hands have been reaching out for another with beseeching appeals, which I could not resist, especially as the Queen promised to come again. Therefore I give you this book, hoping it will receive as warm a welcome as did the other. Thanking the many appreciative little mothers, I am, yours faithfully, Josephine Scribner Gates. End of Introduction Read by Nora Nelson Chapter 1 of More About Live Dolls This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. More About Live Dolls by Josephine Scribner Gates Chapter 1 Mama, what makes your eyes so twinkly and shiny? And a little smile keeps trying to come, just like when you were going to give me my dollhouse. Is it a surprise? asked Janie, one day in October, coming suddenly into Mama's room. Mama slipped her hand into her pocket, where nestled two notes. One was addressed to Mrs. Bell, and was most mysterious and delightful. Its contents would have made Janie's eyes shine too, for it read as follows. Dear Mrs. Bell, could you arrange for a Halloween party and have all the children and their dolls? It is to be a surprise, and I will whisper in your ear that the dolls will bob for apples and toast marshmallows as well as the children. This is by order of the Queen of the Dolls. P.S. I may be a little late, but will surely come. Mama fairly hugged herself when she read this note, but she kept it hidden and handed the other to Janie, saying, There, read that. Isn't that enough to make all our eyes twinkly and shiny? Janie hastily tore the envelope open and read, Dear Janie, I want you to come and stay with me for two weeks. We have a new baby girl and I want you to help me take care of her. Be sure to bring Rosabelle. 
your loving auntie. Janie danced about gleefully, then looked serious for a moment and said, But Mama, can't you go? I don't want to go without you. Not now, darling, Mama replied. But Papa will take you, and I will come and bring you home. You will be so happy with the cunning new baby, you won't be lonesome. You better begin to pack your dolly's trunk so you can be ready to start tomorrow. If there was anything Janie loved next to her doll, it was a baby. So she brought out the tiny trunk and folded the little garments as Mama had taught her. In the lower part, she placed the dresses, dainty underclothes, and petticoats. In the tray, she put the waists, kerchiefs, sashes, hair ribbons, stockings, and slippers. And lastly, in the hat box, a beautiful hat with tissue paper laid carefully about it. Then she closed and locked the trunk, placing the key in the chatelaine at her belt. When this delightful task was finished, she found that Mama had been busy also, and her own small trunk was ready for the journey. Janie put the wee one beside it, then dressed Rosabelle in her sailor suit with the jaunty cap and coat. But Mama, she suddenly cried, what if Rosabelle should come alive while I am there? Wouldn't she frighten the new baby? Mama laughed merrily and replied, Oh, I hardly think she will do that. The queen will surely let you know in some way when it is to happen. I know, but Mama, here it is October, and in June the queen said it would surely happen, and that perhaps it would be in the winter. And I thought maybe it would be soon now, so we could have nice times in the snow, and at Thanksgiving and Christmas. Wouldn't it be fun if the dolls could hang up their stockings? Wouldn't it, though? And perhaps they will, laughed Mama. She turned away to hide the suspicious twinkle in her eyes, for they would dance in spite of her efforts to look serious. Janie's face beamed with delight, and she thought of those beautiful times in the summer, and she and her little friends were eagerly watching for the dear queen's promised second visit. Mama brought out a little satchel, on one side of which was stamped in gold letters, Janie Bell. What do you think of that, dear? she asked. Papa bought it purposely for this trip. Janie danced for joy when she opened it, and found a brush and comb, a tiny cake of soap, and a washcloth, all rolled up in a leather case. Her cup of happiness was full, for such a thing was the pride of her heart, and she tucked in a kerchief and a book to read to Rosabelle if she grew tired of looking out of the car window. She was so excited. She could hardly sleep that night, and arose bright and early. Soon after breakfast, the carriage rattled up to the door, and after a loving goodbye kiss to Mama, Papa and Janie were driven to the station. While they were walking to and fro on the platform, they heard one man call to another, Come down here, Jim, and help me lift the biggest trunk I ever handled. It will break my back to lift it alone, sure. Papa and Janie followed to see this enormous piece of baggage and they laughed heartily when the porter pointed to the gay little trunk marked Rosabelle. And now came the train, with the sudden rush and roar and clatter of engine bells. The noise always frightened Janie, and she clasped her doll tightly, clinging to Papa's hand until they were safely inside the car. Papa sat opposite the two happy faces, and settled back with his newspaper, as all men do. For a while, Janie and Rosabelle watched the houses and trees fly by, but before she knew it, Janie's head sank back on the cushion, and she was fast asleep. She was wakened by hearing the cry, Dinner is now ready in the dining car. She sprang up gladly, for she was very hungry, and what a lovely dinner they had. Rosabelle sat at the table also, but as she was still unalive, of course she could not eat. Leaving them to finish their journey, let us return to Mama, who was as happy as any child over the delightful news she had received from the Queen. She knew what jolly times it meant for the little ones through the winter, and she and Papa had talked matters over and had decided to send Janie to visit the new baby. During her absence, there was to be an addition built to the dollhouse in the shape of one large room, where Janie and her friends could have a warm and comfortable place all to themselves for their frolics when they tired of out-of-door sports. The carpenters appeared the very morning of Janie's departure. If she could have seen them with their tools, working like a swarm of bees, not all the babies in the wide, wide world could have dragged her away from home. 
While the men worked on the new part, Mama and Biddy removed everything from the old dollhouse. Dolls and furniture were piled in a heap, in a clothes basket, and if the queen's wand had been waved over them at that time, the air would have been filled with whales, they were so tangled together. A man with wallpaper and carpets arrived, and it was not long before the house presented a very different appearance. The rooms were furnished in various colors with carpets to match. Fresh curtains were tacked to the windows, and as the old furniture was mostly broken from the constant and unusual wear of the eventful summer, Mama replaced it with some that was much more durable and really meant to be used. The new part was soon finished. It was a good-sized room with a hardwood floor and a large fireplace. Here they would have a crackling wood fire where they could roast chestnuts and apples and popcorn. The walls were covered with figures of children in bright dresses, dancing, rolling hoops, and playing all sorts of games. These pictures were symbolical of the real purpose of the room, which certainly was an ideal one, with its bright rugs, warm red draperies, couch, and cozy chairs. All the children in the village could crowd into it, and Mama intended that they should have a happy winter they would always remember. The house in order, she set to work to make new clothes for the dollies, for really they were looking very shabby. She clothed Dinah in a bright yellow gown, which was truly gorgeous, and just matched the kitchen wall. Something else happened to Dinah, who was so badly treated when she was alive before. Mama broke her poor, unfortunate leg, and put it together properly, as she supposed. Then she deftly scalped her and fastened her wig on straight, determined that when she came to life again, she should at least be comfortable. Alas for Dinah, Mama in her haste had broken the wrong leg, and so the poor thing was indeed in a bad way. The other dolls were arrayed in bright colors. The baby, in a snowy dress, was laid in its cradle, and Papa Doll was elegant in a stylish suit of evening clothes. The pantry shelves gleamed with new dishes, and in the sideboard were new table linen and silver. With new sheets and quilts on the beds, Mama felt that the little house was complete, and she surveyed her work with great satisfaction. She had a little stove set up, so that the family should not suffer from the cold. It was a real child-size base burner, and the coal box, just outside the kitchen door, was heaped to the brim with shiny coal. What fun it would be to fill it and take out the ashes each day. When all was ready, Mama locked the house and prepared for the promised journey. As Halloween was drawing near, before starting, she sent out the invitations for the wonderful party which would fill so many little hearts with joy. When she arrived at her destination, she found Janie having a happy time with the dear new baby. But she was quite ready to return when she was told of the Halloween frolic. End of chapter one. Read by Penny Coffeen, 2023. Chapter Two of More About Live Dolls. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. More About Live Dolls by Josephine Scribner Gates. Chapter Two. They reached home the night before the party. The next day, Janie was so busy making her doll a new gown and planning for the evening. She did not notice the change that had taken place in the yard. Mama was rejoicing because she had been able to keep the surprise from her, when suddenly Janie cried, Mama, why don't you get ready for the party? Let's bring in the tubs and apples. No, dear, Mama answered. Papa is coming early to help me. You get yourself and Dolly ready. You might curl her hair for tonight with the little curling iron Auntie gave you. The hair curling process was a great novelty, and Janie joyfully heated the little iron and played hairdresser. When Rosabelle's toilet was complete, she looked very sweet indeed, all in pink, with her curls standing out in every direction. Janie carefully placed her in a chair and ran away to be dressed herself. She was so excited she could hardly eat her supper, and at last pranced into the parlor, only to return with a face like an interrogation point, crying, Why, Mama! 
The parlor isn't trimmed up a bit. I thought perhaps you had something nice you were keeping from me, but the tubs aren't there, nor anything. It doesn't seem a bit like a party. Janie, said Papa, do you remember the time it rained, when you wanted to go to the seashore, and you cried, but in the end you really had a better time than you ever dreamed of? Now, my dear, you know we have invited all of these children, and of course we will be ready for them. Get your hat and coat, and come along. But, Papa, I wanted to have it here. So you can, dear, but come to the window, and let's see if the moon is coming to this party. Janie, much puzzled by this remark, followed her papa, and her attention was at once attracted to the little house, where the lights were twinkling from the windows, and all across the front was a row of jack-o'-lanterns grinning at her. With Rosabelle in her arms, she fairly pulled papa out of the house and across the yard, and when they were inside, and she saw the beautiful room with its roaring fire, she clapped her hands and danced around with shining eyes. "'How lovely!' she cried. It was a picture. The glow of the fire danced upon the walls, where the children on the paper were making merry with their hoops and skipping ropes. A kettle of molasses stood ready to bubble over the coals. A basket of popcorn was waiting to be shelled by eager hands. A great tub of water was in one corner, with rosy apples sailing about on its surface. And behind a curtain was a tiny tub with crab apples placidly awaiting the doll's pearly teeth. The bell rang, and in trooped a jolly crowd of children, each clasping a beloved doll. Mama welcomed them, for Janie still seemed to be dazed over these delightful happenings. Hats and coats were put away, and then began the fun. The corn was soon shelled, and in the popper, managed very skillfully by Papa. What a strange thing it is, when one thinks of it, to see the dull little grains rolling around as you shake the popper. Suddenly they waken and begin to hop about, and then, as if by magic, the popper is full of a crisp, snowy mass which is poured out and left to its terrible fate. While the corn was popping, Mama put the kettle on and the molasses, boiling and bubbling, soon filled the air with the delightful odor. How the children sniffed the fragrance while they admired the pretty room and chatted over their dolls. Presently, Mama dropped some of the hot molasses on a piece of ice and all watched anxiously to see if it would harden. Each little mouth longed to taste it, but Papa claimed the privilege because he was the only boy and, of course, they could not all have it. He pronounced it done to a turn, and Mama poured it into pans, which she set in a tub of ice to cool. Just at that moment, the tinkling of bells startled them all. The door opened, and in glided the dear fairy queen, gaily singing. With rings on her fingers and bells on her toes, she shall make music wherever she goes. And truly she did, for her scarlet gown was covered with bells, which were also strung about her ankles, neck, and arms. Silver bells, jingling merrily, with every move she made. As she danced around the room, still singing and waving her silver wand, the children danced after her, each eager for a kiss, and crying breathlessly, Oh, you dear darling queen, now will our dolls come alive? In reply, she pointed to one end of the room, where the dolls were in a group. What do you think they were doing? They had come to life at the very moment of the queen's entrance, and during the excitement that followed, they had found the pan of candy, had helped themselves, and were calmly eating it, as though it was all for their especial benefit. With wild shouts, the children ran to them, and hugged and kissed them over and over. You would have thought they had not seen them for a year. Their hearts were so full of joy, they hardly knew what to do next. But Mama knew, and she started them to pulling candy. Their faces beamed while they talked over the good times that must follow, now that this wonderful thing had really and truly happened again. When the candy was finished, Papa brought the tubs of apples, and what fun they had! The dolls were very droll, and when one pushed another into the water, and she stood on her head for an instant, wildly kicking out her feet, the walls echoed with merry laughter. Mama rescued the water baby and bade her run to the fire, 
where she sat like little Polly Flinders, warming her pretty little toes. Now it was time to bake the apples, and they tied strings to the stems and hung them before the fire. Next, they buried chestnuts in the ashes, and how they jumped when they popped out. Lastly, they toasted marshmallows, and when everything was ready, they seated themselves on the floor. The children formed a large circle, and the dolls a small one around the little queen. Mistress Fairy beamed upon them from the center, and the group made a charming picture, with the firelight dancing on the cluster of happy faces. They ate baked apples and cream, sandwiches and gingerbread, corn, candy, and nuts. When they had finished, the queen told them how sad she felt the day she parted from them, and since then, having heard such lovely things about them, she decided that it was time to come again. Then, promising that she would return occasionally to see if all were well, she said good night and went away. And now it was time to go home, and although they had had the jolliest kind of an evening, each little girl was glad to go so that she could be alone with her precious live doll once more. As they left the delightful room, Janie saw the lights twinkling in the kitchen of the dollhouse and begged Mama to let her peep in just for a moment to see if those dolls were alive too. Leaving Rosabel to the care of Papa and Mama, she ran to the kitchen where she found Dinah in a towering rage. She could scarcely speak but managed to gasp out, Now, Miss Janie, just look at me. Why, Dinah, dear, what? cried Janie. Why, this! And Dinah held up her dress and exposed her poor feet, both turned backward. Janie sat down and hid her face in her arms, shaking with laughter, for in spite of such a deformity, Dinah did look too funny and cross for anything. She shook all over, and Dinah came to her and gently patted her, saying, Never mind, Miss Janie, don't sob so. You ain't done it. It was your ma. I seen her. I will try and manage, but I will have to go like a crab the rest of my natural life. Seemed like I must speak when I see she was breaking a wrong one, for I knowed she didn't mean to. One was bad enough, but both, oh dear, but never mind. And she walked away, actually humming her same old tune. Janie went on through the house, and every little girl knows how happy she was when she saw all the pretty new things. It was so still, she began to wonder as she climbed the stairway. When she reached the top, she fancied she heard a funny little rumbling sound. She looked into Mama Doll's bedroom, and there, oh horrors, Papa and Mama Doll were snoring at a great rate. Baby was sleeping quietly, and so were the other doll children. Janie stole down again, and with a contented sigh, left the little house and went to her own room, where she found Rosabel fast asleep in her cradle. She kissed her gently, and, with the other children, was soon dreaming the good time over again. The big moon, bursting from a fleet of silvery clouds, gazed into the various windows of the sleeping village, and seemed so well pleased that he sent little laughing moonbeams rollicking over those happy faces, and chuckled to himself, I told you so. End of chapter 2 Read by Penny Coffeen, 2023「Three of More About Live Dolls. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Dorotely. More About Live Dolls by Josephine Scribner Gates. Chapter 3 Presently the moon disappeared. The fleecy clouds grew dark and the air was filled with starry flakes. By morning, the little village was so white and frosty, it looked like a wedding cake. Janie bounded out of bed, calling to Rosabel to come quick and see the snow. They hurried into their clothes and down to the breakfast table. While they were eating, Bridget appeared with a large parcel, which she said was left for Rosabel. Janie opened it and how they shouted when they saw a miniature sled, a pair of skates, and another package which, 
when the paper was removed, disclosed, What do you think? A real little seal skin coat and hood, with a note from the queen, saying, The seal skin crop was a fine one this year, and there were enough coats for every doll in the village. Rosabel looked like a little robin in her furs. Janey pranced about her, clapping her hands, and both squealed with joy when Rosabel, on thrusting her hands into a tiny pocket, drew out a pair of red mittens. Janey hurried into her coat and hood, and both started off, dragging their sleds. They soon reached the hill. It was a perfect one for coasting, and was alive with children dancing with glee when they saw the dolls hop onto their sleds and glide away. Just think, they cried to one another, what fun we will have this winter, and especially at Christmas time. We will have a Christmas tree, and the dolls will hang up their stockings, and Santa Claus will come, and everything. As these delightful visions passed before them, they hugged one another in their delight, and then jumped onto their sleds and went flying after the dolls. They had such a romp. They tumbled about in the snow, fought a lively snow battle, and wound up by building a snowman, while the dolls busied themselves making snow children huddled all around him. Then they wended their way homeward, for a gentle voice within told them it was dinner time. They scampered into their houses with rosy cheeks and bright eyes, and the food vanished as if by magic. The dolls ate their share too, and even passed their plates for a second helping. This day was but one of many. The children hardly paused to think the hours sped so rapidly, and every moment was one of rejoicing. End of chapter 3 Recorded by DeRotely, Los Angeles, 2023Chapter 4 of More About Live Dolls. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by DeRotely. More About Live Dolls by Josephine Scribner Gates. Chapter 4 Thanksgiving Day was approaching and Mama planned to have a turkey dinner for the village children and their babies. She would set two tables in the new room, and they would have the jolliest kind of a time. Dinah cooked for the doll's table, and for days before, the air was filled with the spicy odors of the nice things that taste so good at holiday dinner parties. The day before Thanksgiving, Rosabelle came over to the dollhouse to play with the doll children and they wandered about in search of something to do. The odors from the kitchen drew them thither, and as Dinah had just finished her hard day's work and gone upstairs to rest a while, they had the field to themselves. They peeped into the pantry where they beheld rows of tiny mints and pumpkin pies and plummy cakes. Some covered pans attracted Rosabelle's attention, and, curious to see what was within, she raised the lids and discovered, to her horror, the cunning bantams which Janie had played with for so long, lying all stuffed, helplessly awaiting their fate. Rosabelle was shocked and exclaimed, "'I won't let you be baked in that hot oven, you darling things!' And she cried to the other dolls, Come, let's hide them. Then, each carefully lifting a wee chick, they hastened out of the house to seek a safe hiding place. Rosabelle's tears were dropping on the tiny form hugged to her breast. To think of Dinah cutting off their poor little heads. The others followed her, making a very funny procession. She led them to a nook where she and Janie often played tea party in the summer, and under a great flat stone, which had served as a pantry, they placed their pathetic burdens. We won't have anything much to eat tomorrow, said Rosabelle, 
but I would choke on the poor little panties. Why can't we put something else in the pans to bake? asked one of the mites. At this timely suggestion, they all clapped their hands in rapture. The coast was still clear, for Dinah had dropped into a sound sleep, from which she could be awakened by nothing short of a fire. Mama Doll was resting also, so these naughty doll children had things pretty much to themselves. They had always longed to cook, but Dinah would never allow them to even glance in the pantry. Of course, they did not know how to cook, but they knew about what went into the dainty dishes and decided to make something unusually good to surprise Dinah. First, they put some flour into each pan, as they knew flour was the basis for most dishes. Then, Rosabelle caught sight of a pan of popcorn and sprinkled that about in the downy bed. Next, she covered it well with sugar, because everybody likes things sweet. A generous supply of salt and pepper followed the sugar. She spied a bottle of ketchup and decided to embroider the top with the red liquid, finishing up by surrounding it with a scrollwork of raisins. After surveying the result of her efforts with the greatest satisfaction and privately rejoicing over Dinah's delight when she discovered these dainties, she put the covers on the pans and pushed them back into their places. This done, they removed all traces of their mischief and returned to the nursery. The next morning, Dinah put the pans into the oven without opening them, as she supposed, of course, the chicks were still there, and it was only when she had the dinner ready to serve that she discovered the birds had flown. When she removed one of the pans from the oven, she looked inside, expecting to see the wee chicks a golden brown. She almost dropped it when she saw the strange, smoking mess. Mama Doll, who was helping Dinah, came to view this odd dish and then opened the other pans. Finding them all alike, they both puzzled over it for some time. And finally, Dinah decided that it was the doll's doing and concluded to serve it and say nothing. Of course, it was not eaten. And if the children had not taken pity on the dolls and shared their turkey with them, they would have fared poorly. The dinner was a grand success otherwise, and they had eaten until they could eat no more. They played games, sang songs, and danced until it was time to go to their little nests. That evening, Rosabelle, whose guilty conscience had been pricking very hard, confessed the naughty prank and was freely forgiven, for Janie loved the bantams dearly and was glad they were saved from the sharp little teeth. End of chapter 4 Recorded by DeRotely, Los Angeles, 2023 Chapter 5 of More About Live Dolls This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Read by Marian Mangubi. More About Live Dolls by Josephine Scribner Gates. Chapter 5 We all know how the weeks fly by between Thanksgiving and Christmas, and this year with no exception. Everyone was busy making things for the trees, gifts for the dollies, and for one another, and all were gay and happy. The one toy store, the pride of the village, was filled to the brim with all sorts of things that delight the hearts of children. This season, Mr. Pennyman had ordered an extra supply of everything, as he felt sure that Santa Claus would have to replenish his stock when he found so many wee stockings by the chimneys. Dolls were the principal things sold during the holidays, and on their arrival, shortly before Christmas, he unpacked them and placed them in rows on the counter. He and his family slept over the store. That night his wife awakened him, saying she heard voices below, and they went down to investigate. On reaching the door, a very funny sight met their eyes. The dolls, piled in a great heap on the counter, had come to life, and all were talking at once. The ones underneath were really suffering, and begged the others to get down so they could breathe. Those on top of the heap sat up, looked about, 
and when they caught sight of their surroundings, joyfully climbed down and made themselves thoroughly at home. The others followed suit, and soon pandemonium reigned. Those musically inclined formed an orchestra, blowing mouth organs and horns, beating drums, and shaking tambourines. Some of the boy dolls wound up the engines and trains, and started them across the floor, shouting, All aboard! Others mounted the rocking horses, which they rode at a breakneck pace. The girls seized the parasols, tried on gloves, swung in the wee hammocks, and one little group proceeded to have a tea party at a wee table set with dainty china. Suddenly one cried, "'Take partners for a quadrille!' and began to play a popular air on a little toy piano. The other musicians joined in, and the dolls had the gayest kind of a ball. At last, tiring of this, the piano player left her seat, and calling, "'Time for refreshments!' started in search of something to eat. They all followed, for who could resist such an invitation, especially when they were famishing? They soon spied the candy jars, but at this point Mr. Pennyman came to his senses and concluded that he must interfere, for he could not afford to have all his candy eaten. He came boldly into the room, although his old heart was beating rather fast, for he did not know what might be the end of this performance. The dolls glanced at him, shouting, "'Merry Christmas!' and then, after each had been supplied with a stick of candy, politely passed it to him, saying, "'Take some! It's lovely! Just fresh!' He saw with dismay that they had nearly emptied one jar, and he told them they must not eat any more, as that was for the Christmas trade, and if they ate it, there would be none for the stockings. They replaced the jar, and after telling him they had a lovely evening, announced that they must go, and started for the door. Poor man was dumbfounded. "'They must go! Go where?' And what was he to do, with Christmas so near at hand? No dolls to sell, and no way of getting a new supply. They walked to the door, deliberately unlocked it, and filed out before the astonished storekeeper could move. The cream of his stock went with them, as each one had a toy of some kind. The girls had tied on hats and bonnets, helped themselves to various garments, and above each head was poised a parasol. The boys had trains of cars, cannons, balls and tops, and their pockets were bulging with bonbons. A jolly-looking crowd they were, and as they disappeared the strains of the song, as we go marching on, floated back to Mr. Pennyman. He and his wife went to the door, and watched the merry crew pass down the street in the early morning light. Then they went back to survey the deserted room. To anyone else it would seem like a very good joke, but to this poor man it was a dreadful disaster. The holidays were his harvest, and he always depended upon these sales for his living for the next year. The amount of money from the dolls alone was a large sum, and he felt that he was ruined. His wife tried to comfort him, and just as he had concluded that all might yet be well, they heard the sound of bells and the blast from a bugle. The door opened, and in walked the dolls in a very different manner from that in which they had left the store. Instead of singing, tears were falling, and heads were bowed. They were led by the little queen, who looked very sad and stern. When all were inside, she closed the door, and told Mr. Pennyman how grieved she was at the behavior of her little people. She made them put back the toys they had taken, and then come, one by one, and tell him how sorry they were, and lastly they had to climb upon the counter and lie down in the same miserable heap. She punished them by saying they could not come alive again until Christmas morning, when she hoped they would be good. She waved her wand over them, and in an instant they were lifeless. Promising to replace the candy they had eaten, she vanished, while Mr. Pennyman was still trying to collect his wits to express his gratitude. With a glance at the innocent little faces, looking really pathetic, lying with closed eyes and cheeks still wet with tears, he returned to his bed as he felt the need of rest after such a trying ordeal. End of chapter 5 Read by Marian Mangubi, Chicago, 2023「6 of More About Live Dolls This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Read by Marian Mangubi. More about live dolls by Josephine Scribner Gates. Chapter 6. At last, the long-looked-for time arrived. The day before Christmas was an ideal one. The ground was covered with snow, and the trees sparkled and glittered in the sunlight. 
the children assured of the fact that santa claus would come in his dear old sleigh went skipping about with beaming faces and long before night each child and each doll had selected the stocking that was to be hung by the chimney with care it was decided that the dolls of the doll house should hang their stockings in the new room with janey's and rosabelle's by the side of the chimney where the old man had ample room to clamber down and where he could not possibly skin his knees and his nose really these modern chimneys cost him much trouble every year and for at least a week after christmas he had to keep his poor nose and knees bathed with pond's extract janey begged mamma to allow her to sleep on the couch in the new room hoping to catch a glimpse of santa claus and perhaps have a word with him mamma consented and at half after seven the dolls all trooped in and hung up their stockings in the greatest glee for this was their first christmas and it seemed very wonderful mamma arranged the couch for janey and rosabelle and tucked them in while papa put out every speck of fire so santa claus could not possibly scorch his poor old toes leaving the door leading to dinah's room open so janey would not feel lonesome they kissed them good night and left them to slumber rosabelle was soon asleep and janey in order to keep awake repeated to herself the dear old poem twas the night before christmas and all through the house not a creature was stirring not even a mouse here she paused and whispered to herself that so far it was true for it was so quiet she could hear nothing but the ticking of the clock she also knew that the stockings were hung by the chimney with care in hopes that santa claus soon would be there and the children were nestled all snug in their beds while visions of sugar-plums danced through their heads in spite of her efforts to stay awake her little brain was just settling into a long winter nap when out on the lawn there arose such a clatter she sprang from her bed to see what was the matter she raised the shade and sure enough the moon was so bright she could see everything perfectly and there oh there was santa claus the miniature sleigh and eight tiny reindeer they were beautiful creatures pawing the snow eager to be off while janey waited expecting to hear him shout to the top of the porch to the top of the wall santa claus shouldered his pack and with one bound was out of his sleigh he paused a moment glanced at the various roofs and chimneys and suddenly catching sight of the large one heaved a sigh of relief and clambered to the porch when janey heard him on the roof she climbed back into bed holding her breath lest she should lose one detail of this unusual and very exciting performance she was hardly settled before she heard him coming down the chimney and in a moment there he was dressed all in fur from his head to his foot and his clothes were all tarnished with ashes and soot the shade was still up and by the light of the moon he caught sight of one large stocking and the six winty ones and he laughed and like the poem he shook all over like a bowl of jelly he was so fat then he said to himself i'd like to know what's the matter with this town anyway everywhere i go i find dolls stockings waiting for me and dolls lie asleep breathing and really and truly alive bless their little hearts i wonder if there are any here he tiptoed over to the couch rosabelle still slept but janey's eyes were wide open when he peered down into her face he looked so jolly and she was so blissfully happy she bubbled over with laughter oh ho he said so you are awake are you and what are you doing awake i was reciting the night before christmas and it was all just like it except when you came you skipped some said janey skipped some what queried the old man well everything was like it i set it all down to where i heard the clatter and sprang from my bed and the moon was on the breast of the new-fallen snow and then you came and you skipped about prancer and dancer and donder and blixen i did so want to see you when you cried to the top of the porch to the top of the wall now dash away dash away dash away all and you didn't dash away at all you just got out and why didn't you at this santa claus laughed harder than ever and replied why my dear do you suppose there is room enough on this little house for my eight reindeer and the sleigh there might possibly have been still i was afraid to risk it and now it is my turn to ask questions perhaps you can tell me if this town is bewitched or what is the matter come let's have a visit i see a lot of wood here and i will build a fire and warm my toes while we talk you get up and put on your wrapper and bed slippers and tell me all about it janey was so overjoyed at the prospect of a chat with the dear old man she never thought of being frightened she hopped out of bed and jumped into her flannel wrapper and slippers and santa tucked her into a big chair and pulled it close to the fire then sitting down opposite and stretching his legs out to the blaze he leaned back and sighed janey's sympathies were at once aroused and she asked are you tired santa claus wouldn't you like to have me get you something to eat his keen old eyes brightened at the mention of food yes i am tired he answered and hungry too i started early and have had a long cold ride 
Janey flew into the dollhouse kitchen and brought him all she could find, a tiny pie, a loaf of bread, a plate of donuts, and a pitcher of milk. Santa Claus surveyed this spread with an amused twinkle in his eyes. He took up the plate of donuts, saying, Did you think I wanted to play Jack Stones? and gobbled them up in one mouthful. They were followed by the bread and pie. Then he took the pitcher of milk and held it off and gazed at it, inquiring, What is this for? Why, that is milk for you to drink, and here is a glass, Janey cried, handing him a tumbler not much larger than a thimble. He threw back his head and laughed like a schoolboy. There it is again, he chuckled. A thimble full of milk, donuts like marbles, pies the size of dollars, and a loaf of bread smaller than a biscuit. What does it mean, anyway? Instead of putting dolls' toys into little girls' stockings, I've had to put them into doll stockings, the like of which I never saw before. Then I had to go back to Mr. Pennymore and load up with more things for the children. Do tell me about it. So Janey, proud of having so distinguished a listener, told him of the Queen's visit in the summer, and of her reappearance, and of the pleasure she had brought. Santa Claus was very much interested, and asked many questions. Suddenly he exclaimed, "'Well, well, well, now I have played a joke on all of you. Do you know what I have brought this year? Something new, a foreign doll for each child. I thought it would be an education for you to see the costumes of the different countries, and what kind of dolls the little ones play with all over the world. Won't you have fun when they come to life and talk? You will hear enough Spanish, French, German, Chinese, and Italian to last you a lifetime. I wish I could be here to hear them jabber. I declare, I would like to see one of your dolls perform. At this moment, as if anticipating his wish, Rosabelle turned over and opened her eyes. They rested on the cozy picture before the fire, and she hopped out of bed, ran over to Janey, snuggled in beside her, and then, pointing at Santa Claus, asked, "'Who's that fat man, and what makes him look so jolly?' At these words, Santa Claus sent up such a hearty shout of laughter that Janey feared he would rouse the inmates of the dollhouse, and her fears were well grounded, for in a moment in rushed the whole family in their little night dresses. Mama Doll was even carrying the baby, and the wee ones were rubbing their eyes. Every one of them wanted to know what was the matter. Dinah was at the rear end of this undressed parade, and she was such a comical sight that Santa Claus went off into another peal of laughter. She wore yellow pajamas and a turban of the same glowing color. With her poor feet going the wrong way, she was a picture long to be remembered. Janie introduced Santa Claus, and the merry saint, after greeting them cheerily, told of his life and related many interesting things that had happened during his yearly trips. He wound up by telling them that in all the years he had been traveling, he had never had such a novel experience as this, that it had been a great delight to him to behold this miracle, and that hereafter he would take more interest than ever in the manufacturing of dolls, and would be very careful to know that each was perfect before it left the shop. After he had finished, he bade them return to their beds so he could fill their stockings and be off. The dolls filed out, and giving Janie and Rosabelle each a rousing kiss, he placed them on the couch and tucked them in as tenderly as any mother. He turned their faces to the wall and made them promise not to peek, but they listened, trying in vain to guess what he was putting in the stockings. While this operation was going on, the poem kept saying itself in Janie's brain as though it had not been interrupted by Santa's coming. He went straight to his work, filled all of the stockings, and turned with a jerk. Here, Janey heard him stamping out the few remaining live coals, then laying his finger aside of his nose and giving a nod up the chimney he rose, and she heard him exclaim, ere he drove out of sight, Merry Christmas to all and to all a good night! She put her arms around Rosabelle and whispered with a contented sigh, Isn't he the dearest old man? Then both floated away into dreamland, and Janey in her dream fancy was in his lap, his arms holding her close, and she was amusing herself by blowing through his thick white beard. Suddenly the fire cracked unusually loud, and she awakened to find Papa had just started a roaring blaze. A glance at the stockings showed that they were all bulging and running over. She sprang out of her bed, shouting, "'Merry Christmas, Papa! We did see Santa Claus, and he sat right in that chair! And we had the loveliest visit!' And then she told him all about it. Of course Papa thought she had dreamed the visit, but as Janey persisted in saying that she had not, and Rosabelle also seemed so sure Santa had been there, Papa began to wonder if it could be true. A note pinned to Janey's stocking settled the question, for this is what it said. Dear little Janey, I forgot to thank you for your kindness to me last night, especially for the lunch you served, hoping you will all enjoy the contents of your stockings and wishing long lives to your dolls. I am yours faithfully, Santa Claus. 
Such convincing proof of the old man's visit had to be accepted, and when the dolls from the dollhouse related their experience with him, Papa decided there was no longer a doubt about it as they could not all have dreamed the same thing. Soon after, when Mama came in, the strange tale was repeated to her, and then, as all were dressed, they seated themselves on the floor and proceeded to examine the contents of the stockings, and the walls echoed the glad cries of, Oh, oh, and look at this, and isn't that lovely? The dolls found all sorts of presents to please dolls, and Janie's stocking contained many things for which her little heart had longed. A French doll filled her with delight, and as Mademoiselle was drawn from the stocking and greeted her with a bonjour, spoken in a piping voice, Janie shrieked with laughter. A tiny trunk contained her wardrobe, which was very complete, and disclosed many exquisite garments made in Parisian fashion. After breakfast, Janie started out to visit her little friends and see what had been put into their stockings. Every child had a foreign doll, as Santa Claus had promised, and very droll the dollies looked, dressed in the quaint costumes peculiar to their country, and they spoke such gibberish. When they were all together, chattering at one another, it was very funny, because each doll spoke a different tongue, and not one of them could understand what the others were saying. That afternoon they were to have the grand Christmas tree. The children had spent days and days preparing for this. They had strung popped corn and cranberries, they had gilded nuts, and they had made all sorts of things with which to decorate the tree. On Christmas, Papa and Mama worked for hours on the tree, keeping the door of the room closed and locked until all was ready. The result was something beautiful, and when the children and their dolls were at last admitted to the room, their expressions of delight fully repaid Papa and Mama for their labor. While they were admiring the glittering tree, suddenly they heard the sweet jingle of bells, and in a moment in glided the little queen. With her, could Janie believe her eyes? There was dear old Santa Claus! Perched on his shoulders were two of the brightest of boy dolls, dressed in black velvet spangled with silver stars. The queen handed a long silver ladder to the old gentleman. He took it and held one end to the top of the tree and braced the other firmly against his fat body. Up the ladder danced the black velvet boys and began to move the presents. They climbed down to Santa's shoulders with their arms full, and he called out the names marked on the packages. As each child shyly presented herself, he filled the eager, uplifted hands. When the tree was empty, the little fellows climbed to the very top and there performed the queerest sort of antics. They hung by their toes from the ends of the branches. They stood on their heads and played seesaw with a branch stretched across one of the limbs, and finally, with a leap in the air, they turned somersaults all the way down. Landing on their feet with gay little bobs and nods, they climbed back to their perch on Santa Claus's broad shoulders. Santa Claus's speech followed this performance and was the climax of the entertainment. He said, I never dreamed that such a miracle could come to pass. To see the dolls whose like I have made and given away for so many years come to life is astounding, and I shall remember this momentous occasion forever. It has always been my great joy to know that once a year I was able to make so many little hearts happy. I have looked forward to the glad holiday season as much as the children, and my happiest time has been when I have made ready for the Christmas journey. I have always flattered myself that I was a king among children, and that no one could make them quite so happy, but now I feel that I must yield the honor to the little queen, for none of my doings could ever bring such blissful happiness as these live dolls have brought into the village. When he stopped speaking, he knelt before the queen and surprised her by presenting her with a tiny satin box doing this with a grand flourish and a bow that almost tumbled the black velvet boys from his shoulders. Then, and rousing applause from his delighted audience, they vanished, boys and all, up the chimney. When he had surely gone, the children crowded about the queen to see the gift she had received. She opened the box, and there was a dainty pin in the form of a crown set with pearls. When this had been admired, they showed the queen their presents, and after a happy visit and merry frolic, the party was ended, and they went to their homes, rejoicing in the memory of a Christmas never to be forgotten. Even Papa and Mama sighed to be children again. End of chapter 6 Read by Marian Mangubi, Chicago, 2023This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Read by Penny Coffeen. More About Live Dolls by Josephine Scribner Gates. Chapter 7 
Soon after the holidays, the children were filled with excitement over the announcement that on Washington's birthday, there would be a grand ball at the doll farm, and this was to be the end of the joyous celebrations for the present, as the dollies would then resume their former conditions. Of course, this news cast a damper over the spirits of the little ones, but feeling that it was for the best, and thankful for the long, lovely winter they had enjoyed, they banished the thought of the lonesome future, and threw their whole hearts into preparations for the ball. The queen promised to provide the dolls with party gowns, and the various mothers set their wits to work and fashioned those for the children. They were very quaint and pretty, of various colors, and made with trains, panniers, and puffed sleeves, after the style of those worn in George Washington's time. When the dolls' costumes came, they created great excitement, for they were works of art. Rosabelle's was pure white, and glistened and shimmered like drops of dew. To wear with this gown were embroidered stockings, white slippers, fan, gloves, and an ornament for her hair. The eventful night arrived, and they were taken to the party in bobsleds, and what a jolly ride it was! The man in the moon smiled down on the happy faces, and like Cinderella, wished that he too might go to the ball. They sang and shouted to the accompaniment of the jingling bells, and soon reached the farm, which Janie had not seen since the summer before, when she had plucked the little dresses and hats from the trees. All was white with snow now, and the house looked beautiful. The roof was aglow with Japanese lanterns, each trying to outshine the other. Every window was ablaze with light, and as they neared the house, strains of sweet music filled the air. They were ushered into the queen's room, where they removed their wraps, and then went up to the attic, which had been transformed into a ballroom. The scene that met their eyes was fairyland. Many gay-colored lanterns swung from the ceiling. The whole room was trimmed with garlands of flowers, and behind a bower of roses was seated an orchestra, composed of boys' dolls dressed in evening clothes. They handled their tiny instruments with the greatest skill, and their music was exquisite. The ball was opened with a grand march, and it was a picture well worth seeing. A magnificent rainbow spanned the room. It was formed by the children and dolls, all in their odd costumes of glorious colors, radiant with spangles. Each one had her powdered hair dressed high, and on top of the coil was poised a butterfly or hummingbird. As they marched, they formed all sorts of figures, and finally the dolls concluded with some fairy dancing, which was very graceful and pretty. They all danced until suddenly they were startled by a ta ra from the bugle, and immediately the dolls vanished. The children were asked to seat themselves at one end of the room, before which was stretched a curtain. What was coming now? Soon the queen appeared and announced that she had prepared a few pantomimes, which she hoped would please them. Then the lights went out, leaving the room in utter darkness. The performance which followed was an unusual and beautiful one. You all know Mother Goose melodies, and if the rhymes give so much pleasure, you can imagine what it would be to see each one pictured out by dolls. Old Mother Hubbard, Jack Horner, Babes in the Woods, the little man wheeling his bride in a wheelbarrow, Jack and Jill, Jack Spratt, and all the rest of the goodly company. A mammoth shoe filled with dolls, and in their midst the queen waving her wand over them was shown last. When this tableau had been duly admired, the queen cracked a whip, expecting the shoe to be drawn off the stage with fine effect. But something went wrong. The dolls leaned too far over one side, and out they all tumbled in confusion. The curtain descended amid a patter of applause and ripples of laughter. And now the refreshments were brought in by little maids, in whom Janie recognized the nurses from the doll hospital. They served such delicious things. There were tiny cups of chocolate with sandwiches, angel food, and ice cream. The ice cream was in the form of flowers, lilies, roses, and tulips, and was really almost too pretty to eat. After these, bonbons were passed, 
each one of which contained a dainty flower pin. Janie's was a blue enameled forget-me-not, and Rosabelle's was a lovely pink rosebud. It was growing late, and soon the curtain at the end of the room was drawn aside once more. The queen stood in the center of the stage before the gay throng, and in a few words she told them the time had come to say goodbye. She said that Santa Claus's speech was still ringing in her ears, and then she made one herself. This is what she said. I shall always prize very highly the beautiful crowns he has given me. I am very proud to know that he felt I was worthy to wear it. I know I can never take his place in the hearts of the children. Yet, since I have the power to make them so happy, I feel that it is my duty to come again. For me, the sweetest thing in life is to make glad the children, and my heart has been singing with joy ever since I found I could bring so much pleasure into their lives. She bent forward and called her listeners to her, and while they clustered about her, she pressed a loving goodbye kiss on each little upturned face and bade them farewell. And now we too must part from our little folks, and although we leave them with a pang of regret, we must rejoice with them to know that perhaps, sometime, our hearts will again thrill with delight at the clear notes of the bugle and the peal of the silver bells. End of chapter 7 End of More About Live Dolls by Josephine Scribner Gates